Hello, comrades, and welcome back to Marxist Voice, the podcast of the Revolutionary Communist Party. I'm your host, Jack Ty Wilson, and we're joined once again by Fiona Lawley. Hey, Fiona, how's it going? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, I'm great, thanks. Yeah. Uh, what have you been up to over the weekend? Anything nice? Well, um, actually, this weekend I was at youth, a youth demand summer camp and um, talking to a bunch of yeah, young people who are very keen to organise, I would say, in a revolutionary way, or they're looking to organise a revolutionary way um, against the system because of the climate change, but also because of Palestine. Um, but also this weekend, I've been following really closely everything that's been happening in Bangladesh. And actually, just this morning, we've reached the peak, almost the culmination of how this revolution now has unfolded um i've just seen that the prime minister has been forced to flee um, mm. in bangladesh uh, there's like a video of her trying to get into the helicopter <laughs> and people are celebrating there's videos pictures and people getting to her official residence yeah i've seen a video of someone lying in her bed or something yeah, like that her interior decor is not very good no, so. no. <laughs> very drab yeah. i've also seen videos as well in the local area in east london in Whitechapel, for example, it's a local Bangladeshi community waving flags, cheering down the streets. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is being felt by Bangladeshi people all over the world. But I would say it will go beyond that. This is another victory for the masses, for the working class, for students, for the oppressed, um, coming together and showing their power. And yeah, the videos, the scenes coming out of Bangladesh are incredible. But of course, we know this isn't the end. Mm. And we've got to make sure we pay attention to what happens over the next 24, 48 hours, mm -hmm. especially with the army trying to implement an interim government. And our message is clear that they, the masses, the students, the workers go the whole way um, yeah. and, and take power. Yeah, I've been also following this quite closely as well. And I believe there's now an article on Marxist.com, the website yes. of the Revolutionary Communist International. And I'm sure there'll be a lot more analysis uh, throughout the week. So yeah, if any of our listeners and viewers at home, be sure to head to Marxist.com for the latest news and analysis, not just in Bangladesh, but of course around the world as well. We've got some amazing articles recently on the events in uh, Kenya, of course, the Venezuelan elections, the events in France as well. So yeah, definitely head there. But that's not what we're here to talk about today, is it? Um, we're here to talk about something perhaps a bit uh, less inspiring. Yes. Uh, <laughs> the opposite. <laughs> the complete opposite, yes, indeed. I mean, obviously, our perspectives are that across the world there are going to be swings to the left, yes. which is what we're seeing in Bangladesh and elsewhere, but also swings to the right as well, which we're unfortunately seeing right now in Britain. Uh, so, yeah, for anyone who doesn't know about this uh, already, um, I'd be surprised if you didn't because it's been all over the news. Uh, but yeah, last week's events uh, saw, I think, the largest rise in far-right violence that we've seen in Britain for years, if not decades, I would say, uh, sparked by a stabbing, a uh, tragic stabbing in, um, in Stockport in the northwest. Um, you know, three children, I believe, were killed, and a number of others were hospitalized by these injuries. And uh, yeah, on the back of that, fueled by far-right disinformation and rumors, about the uh, the identity of the culprit. People were saying that he was a uh, Muslim and an asylum seeker and so on. We've seen now uh, rioting in a number of different places, uh, in Stockport itself on the day following the uh, the stabbing, but also in places like Hartlepool, uh, Sunderland as well over the weekend, uh, when there's a police station burned down, I believe, there. Uh, places like Manchester, Sheffield, uh, Hull, Aldershot, Blackburn, Leeds, Leicester, Stoke, Liverpool, Belfast, uh, and so on. It's really been raging across the entire across the entire country. And the last I read, there have been uh, over 400 uh, far right thugs that have been arrested. And I think it's no exaggeration, really, to say that this has been uh, a pogrom. Really, it's been a hate fueled, um, you know, pogrom. People have been going, uh, setting uh, hotels, housing asylum seekers uh, on fire. I think that happened in Rotherham near Sheffield. And um, there have been cases of essentially lynch mobs going around assaulting individual uh, black and, and Asian people, for example. There was one report of an acid attack in, in Middlesbrough. And yeah, there's all sorts of horrific things that are taking place, uh, for example, in Middlesbrough as well. There were um, essentially racial checkpoints being set up in, in certain areas of the city centre, people checking the identity of uh, taxi drivers and motorists and so on before they let them go through. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's really awful, harrowing uh, scenes. I think the ruling class are definitely very alarmed at this. Uh, Star, for example, this morning has uh, convened a COBRA meeting, like an emergency meeting of all the different government ministers and so on, and they're promising you know, to bring the full force of the law down on these uh, mm -hmm. on these thugs. Um, but I think it seems like already the situation has really spiraled out of the government's control. And uh, yeah, I mean, 
just to end my monastery and hope Pia Starmer has enjoyed his one month long uh, honeymoon period because that has now well and truly came to an end. The whole you know, country has descended into, into chaos, basically. So I think many of our viewers and listeners at home might be thinking, might be feeling quite shocked, quite confused, perhaps even quite upset as well. And certainly they want to know, you know, what the hell is going on, basically. So yeah, I'd like to hear your thoughts uh, on, on all of this uh, chaos that's unfolded and yeah, um, what, why it's happening now, basically. Yeah, yeah, we've got to like take a deep breath <laughs> and take stock of what's happened because I think over the last week, really, and then specifically over the weekend, I know for myself and I'm sure for so many other people, you've had feelings of immense sadness and fear, and then it kind of vacillates, I would say, towards anger, um, mm-hmm. which I can, I'll come on to in a moment. Um, because there is this kind of just desperate feeling of how on earth is this happening, why am I going onto my phone and watching videos of people being beaten up, mobs of people. Mm. And as you say, these are pogroms, and we have to say it for Mm. what it is. Um, In the mainstream media, there's always a desperate attempt to downplay things, um, especially when it affects Muslim communities Mm. of black people or or whatever it is. Um, And, you know, I've seen a a couple of reports or headlines where they refer to protesters on either side, you know, as though there's an equivalence. Um, One BBC journalist referred to one of these hate marches as a pro-British march or something like that, which is absolutely dreadful. It's it's unbelievable, but it's actually a a reflection of an example of what the mainstream media has done for years. Um, And the media, at the end of the day, is just a mouthpiece for the ideas and the interests of the ruling Mm -hmm. class, and the ideas and the interests of the ruling class for well, forever, but specifically over the last 10 years, have been to whip up as much Islamophobia, racism, division, um, anti-migrant mm-hmm. rhetoric, and policy. Mm-hmm. They've, they've done this for the last 10 years as much as possible. So the first thing we have to do, and, and, and I always say this to my own comrades and to myself when, when we watch these things and I'm feeling overwhelmed by it, is try and understand the processes that are, are at play. Mm-hmm. And first and foremost, yeah, where does this horrific racism in society come from? It comes from the ruling class, and it's come from, in the main, for the last 10 to 15 years, the Tories, who have mm-hmm. been in power, who have whipped up racist ideas and tried to implement racist policies. Um, you can see the beginnings of, of, of a kind of uh, mainstreaming of a lot of racist ideas through the Brexit referendum, mm-hmm. for example. Um, yeah, but Theresa May's hostile environment is a good example of that as well, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and the Windrush um, scandal which came out under Theresa all of this kind of stuff. It's been there. Um, and what we're seeing now is just the a kind of logical endpoint mm-hmm. of what the ruling class and its media has promoted for so, so, so long. But I would say particularly in the last couple of years, it's become even more extreme. Um, as the Tories kind of lurched to the right whilst they were in power to try and begin to stave off what they saw as a kind of coming rebellion mm-hmm. from the likes of, uh, not rebellion, or kind of uh, claiming of a space mm-hmm. from the likes of Nigel Farage and um, these other parties. Um, they were sensing that a little bit. Um, and also they were just desperate to save to power. So they went to the, the most gutter form of policies that they could, like mm-hmm. rural understanding, for example, um, to try and distract from the complete catastrophe that is Britain mm-hmm. and still currently is. Um, so they really whipped it up in a more extreme way. Swella Braveman um, has been the, the queen of racism um, mm-hmm. over the last couple of years, demonising the Palestine marches as hate marches, um, talking constantly about the need to stop the boats, about migrants swarming in, invaders, all of this kind of stuff. Um, and, and I will say, sometimes when the Tories did this, there'd be a few you know, moments in the media where some more liberal types of papers would say, well, shouldn't we be a bit more worried about the language that we use yeah. now? Isn't the language going a bit too far and it's getting a bit scared? And it's true, the language is disgusting and the language causes things that we've seen. But it's not just the language, it's also the policy, it's also what they actually do. The language is reflective of that as, as well. So that's the kind of the general scene that we've been in for the last you know, 15 years of the Tories and then the last couple of years in particular. And then add to that the general election and Keir Starmer, 
mm. and his role, which has been to prove to the ruling class that he has made the Labour Party a safe vessel for big business and capitalist interests. That has been Keir Starmer's role. And what does that also mean? That also means racism. Because you cannot have capitalism without racism, as, as, as Malcolm X famously said. Mm-hmm. And he was right then, and he's right today. And that is why the Labour Party and Keir Starmer, in the recent general election, were doing everything they could to prove that actually they were going to deport more migrants, mm-hmm. and that they were the more sensible, efficient party to get into power to lower immigration. Keir Starmer said, and it was on the front page, I think of The Sun, the headline was, read my lips, I will lower immigration, I will cut immigration. He said, if you want lower immigration, vote Labour, I will stop the votes. Mm. So it's the Tories and Keir Starmer who's kind of run after um, the Tories recently. And all of them are tailing Nigel Farage as well. All of those people, all of those parties, essentially the establishment as a whole, has set the scene for all of this. They have set the scene for racism because it flows from the capitalist system and their need to divide the working class. That is the first thing that we know, that racism comes from the top of society. Mm-hmm. And then, if you add that scene to the complete destitution that exists in society, that provides the fertile ground for fascists mm-hmm. to appear and for fascists to crop up. And what we've seen is this moment where this kind of the scum that sits at the bottom of the ocean, if you want, mm. suddenly rises to the top mm. and is having its moment. Um, and, and, and the results have been yeah, these horrific, horrific attacks that have taken place over the weekend. And more are planned. More are planned. Mm. That's the other thing. The fact that the Tories and the Labour Party set the scene for this mainstream racism also emboldened Nigel Farage, it emboldened the Reform Party as a whole, that won them certain MPs. That victory of those MPs emboldened these other fascists that exist in society, and now they've come out. Mm-hmm. All of these things is a direct line from the Tories to Keir Starmer, um, to Nigel Farage, mm-hmm. to Reform, and then to the fascists. Um, mm-hmm. And we can, we can see the connection between all of these forces in society. It's not random. Um, we know why they're there. And so the next question is, what are we going to do about it? Yeah, I, I like what you said as well about the, the idea of this deprivation and, and ultimately the neglect of these, these, these communities, these working class communities over the course of decades has created that fertile ground for these you know, fascists and far-right demagogues to, to take root, basically. And uh, yeah, I think it's no coincidence, therefore, that a lot of these initial uh, riots and, and pogroms and so on cropped up in precisely these kind of uh, yeah, deindustrialized towns, especially in the north of England as well, places like Teesside, Wearside, uh, the northwest Merseyside, and, and so on. Uh, ultimately, yeah, I think as you said, this is all the product of the, of the, uh, the dramatic uh, decline of British capitalism and, and the sort of sickness that is uh, kind of taking root in society because precisely of the lack of a, of a viable revolutionary alternative at this point in time. There's this massive anti-establishment movement in society. There's a complete collapse in faith in the sort of so-called sensible centrist politics that uh, you know, allegedly the Tory party and then Starmer uh, claim to represent. Um, and yeah, you know, without an alternative, people will naturally be sort of taken in uh, by you know, these certain demagogues like Tommy Robinson, Andrew Tate, you know, uh, all these people. And this isn't just a British thing as well. Right? We can observe the exact same process, more or less in a similar way, in other countries as well. Like in France, where Le Pen and her party have seen a massive rise in support. Mm. I think there are certainly parallels with Trumpism uh, yeah. as, as well. And yeah, I think it's just an example. In fact, it, it brings to mind Rosa Luxemburg's famous uh, quote about how you know, the, the future that stands before us is socialism or barbarism. Mm. The crisis of capitalism is dragging us into so many untold uh, you know, barbaric horrors. You've got you know, the war in, in, uh, in, in Gaza, the, the, the genocide that's taking place there, the, the um, the threat now of a regional conflict as well, uh, all of these different things. And this is just one example of that, I think. And we're going to see more and more of these violent swings to the right and the left in the next period. Um, but yeah, I think that does bring us nicely then to you know, how we're going to try and fight back against this and then get organized. So the first question I want to ask then is what has been the response of the left and also of the, the labor movement more generally uh, to, this, uh, to this threat of far right violence? Yeah, I think the first thing that, that people have responded with is just complete shock. Um, you know, how is this happening? Oh no, oh God. Um, especially from the kind of liberal um, papers and liberal individuals and, and figures. 
And this kind of sense of, oh, maybe this is Britain, you know, Britain is yeah. like this, aren't we reasonable people? <laughs> and it comes from this really nauseating idea um, that is kind of promoted, I would say, even through education and a lot of different things, um, that, that Britain is this respectable place in the British mm-hmm. establishment. Um, and it's, it's the racism here is, is not as extreme, essentially, as other places like in America. Mm. You know, British papers and, and British education is always reporting on. Um, I'm thinking of my my educational experience. We learn a lot about the civil rights movement in America, mm. and isn't it dreadful and that and so forth. But nothing about um, like anti racism in the yeah. UK or Britain's real role mm. um, in slavery. And yeah. the way we're taught about the end of slavery is this kind of noble, you know, enlightenment period <laughs> where the British decided actually slavery is wrong. And then Britain promoted our slavery order to the world. And it's just the complete um, opposite yeah. of, of the truth of, of, of what's happened um, and how slavery came to end. But that can be discussed uh, a whole other time. I'm but sure that, we'll have a future episode on that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that really permeates the kind of a bit of the psyche, if you mm-hmm. want, about some kind of liberal approaches um, mm-hmm. to this kind of thing. Um, and so there's that, but we don't really spend so much time on that. But beyond that, yeah, there are, what, what flows from that kind of liberal approach as well is that okay, well, we don't like what we're seeing and we do think it's wrong and fascists are bad, so um, we need the police and the police um, should do more and the police should be out there arresting all of these people. Mm. We should um, prescribe different organisations, all of this kind of stuff, restrict people's access to social media. Mm. Um, Maybe if someone like Tony Robinson didn't have social media, this wouldn't happen and so on and so forth. And look, there are different degrees to all of this stuff, right? Um, obviously, we don't think that fascist groups should be allowed to organise and go out there. Obviously, we don't think it's a good thing that Tommy Robinson has this platform and can spread malicious lies and whip people up in the way that he does. However, we have absolutely no faith or trust in the police or in any mainstream institution to try and solve this problem, um, or to even have a genuine interest in, in doing so. Often what you find um, is when people call for more police to come into these things to try and you know calm the situation down, it does the complete opposite. And actually it's black people and Muslims and our own communities that, that are the most policed um, mm. and, and, and can come out of it um, far off. And so in these places that like, we already know, we don't trust the police. These are the same people also historically who terrorised us anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think it's a bit misguided, um, these calls for, for more police on the streets mm-hmm. as though that's going to solve what is happening. Um, and and, I, and I, don't think, I don't think it will at all. Yeah. It's almost like all of the lessons of the fight against the far right in the 1970s have been completely forgotten. Like yeah. You saw that back then with the Battle of Southall, the Battle of Brick Lane, what happened in Bradford as well, that at every single step the police did absolutely nothing, or at least the amount of force that they used against the left was massively disproportionate to yeah. the amount of force they used against the right, because largely, you know, these peace forces are, in, are embedded with, uh, you know, with racism, with, with sexism as well, Islamophobia, yeah. uh, and just general corruption and abuse and so on. So it's no coincidence, therefore, that uh, yeah, peace forces tend to have a much softer touch on these far right groups. I imagine many of the officers will have a lot of sympathies with these uh, with these far right groups in, in some cases. Um, yeah, and yeah. Uh, sorry, yeah, what just made me think that, as you say, we've got all of these great examples from history about Cable Street, Lewisham, Sample, all of these things where what we saw was like organised communities mm. um, themselves coming out um, in conjunction with the working class, in conjunction with the labour movement at some time, and I'll come on to this in a second. Um, and it was that decisive power that forced fascists mm. back off the streets, right? Um, and what I think is interesting is that actually, we've even seen that this weekend, mm. right? We have seen in certain places, like in Bolton um, and in other places, sure, well, um, people, and, and like mainly like young Muslim people, young Asian people, themselves coming out to defend mm. their streets, to defend their mosques, to defend their areas, to defend their communities, because they have realized and they know already that they can, and they, they can only rely on themselves, and they're not going to wait around for someone else to, to come in. They're not going to wait for the police um, by any means. So it's already an organic process that is that is taking place. And the reason I, I, I want to highlight this is because you have seen some trade union leaders and some trade union figures 
come out with some good statements, I would mm. say, about the need to, to smash the fascists off the streets. Um, you know, we've done it before, we did it in the 70s, you know, and we'll do it again, mm -hmm. which is good. Um, but what we should say now to those trade union leaders and those trade unions is let's, you know, see that now in action. Let's mm -hmm. transform these words into deeds. Use your movement, use your authority, use your resources to join up with these young people who are already taking the necessary steps that, that they that they need so that they're not isolated from the rest mm -hmm. of the, the labor movement. That is the responsibility of the labor movement now, I would say, to step up um, and actually and actually be a part of this. 100%, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, if you look, for example, at the membership of even just one trade union, Unite the Union, the biggest one in the country, I believe, 1.2 million members in the UK and Ireland Imagine if that might was mobilized, that yeah. muscle was used to join up with these communities that are already beginning to defend themselves. That would be an enormous change in the situation. That would immediately put these fascists and their far right people on the back foot. Yeah. In fact, I think, honestly, the threat would just evaporate almost immediately if they were faced with the, the might of, of, of the organized uh, working class. I think everywhere the, a demo, a far right demo has been planned, um, a counter demonstration needs to be planned and people need to get organized in a serious way and take the question of self-defense extremely seriously. Mm -hmm. And I would say that this is already happening in so many places, right? People want to do something. People don't just want to sit around and watch these people run amok in their streets, terrorizing businesses, shops and um, and setting you know hotels on fire, all of this kind of stuff. Um, but this needs to be organized in a serious way to stop these people coming back. We need to totally um, humiliate and demoralize them um, if we want to actually see this come to an end. And, and this requires, yeah, call outs for, for, for committees even in mm -hmm. certain places. And, and but the grounds for that already is already happening. Um, mm -hmm. And this needs to be expanded on, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's not just a question of like the technical organization of, of like self defense. I mean, of course, obviously, as a, as a last result, we do need to be there on the streets physically defending these targeted communities and, and, and you know, mosques and hotels and, and so on as, as a movement. But it's also a political question as well, right? Because that then deals with the question of how do you get more people uh, on side? And you need to bring in certain social questions as well. And uh, I mean, this is slightly related, but I would say that, um, you know, a large part of the appeal of these figures, like Tommy Robinson, like Nigel Farage, for example, um, is that they're able to opportunistically uh, sort of utilize questions like housing, like employment, like public services, that a lot of people feel, you know, rightly so, like a genuine anxiety around. But instead of obviously pointing it towards the capitalist class and the establishment as, as we would, they then direct that towards, yeah, towards asylum seekers and then towards the left uh, as well. And they, these are real questions. You know, there is a massive housing shortage. The NHS is obviously you know, crumbling uh, apart and there aren't enough jobs to go around. Uh, and these are things that the trade union movement and the, and the workers movement in general, the left, should be taking up and, and filling with the class content and revolutionary content in order to actually yeah, demoralize and split the ranks of these, uh, you know, these right-wing groups and so on. So yeah, what do you make of this question of, you know, adopting a political program to combat the threat of the far right as well? Yeah, this is absolutely right. The two things have to be done at the exact same time. Otherwise, we aren't solving the issue. We aren't um, genuinely trying to politically kill fascism, mm -hmm. which is ultimately what we need to try to do. Um, and so there's two things here. One, yeah, is the immediate need for self-defense, right? Um, which will, you know, take place in the form of, of mass blocks in the road, you know, mm -hmm. is getting as many people out there as possible to stop those fascists coming in. But as you say, there's a wider political point, a political struggle that needs to be, that needs to take place. Um, it'll happen at the same time, but also in different ways. Obviously, what we're not saying is that when we have these mass blocks in the road, we're going to try and convince yeah. the fascists <laughs> that we're coming up against about, you know, our political ideas yeah. and our demands. I'll be honest, on these kind of demos, you're not having political discussions. <laughs> um, you're there to stop physically yeah. people from being able to, to come towards you or come towards your community or whatever it is, right? That needs to take place. But yeah, outside of that, um, a serious kind of reflection needs to be had. Also in the left, right, part of the reason that this is happening is because the left for years hasn't done enough to actually, as you said, answer 
the desperate situation that exists in, in, in Britain. Um, and so we have to be very, very concrete and very precise. I don't think calls for love over hate or for hope over despair um, are enough. And I actually think that doesn't speak to the gravity of what people mm. feel right now. Yeah, what well, hope is that? People feel hopeless, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, what we need to do is one, physically stop the fascists from coming forward, but two, also, as you say, have a serious, genuine revolutionary program that can mobilize the most determined revolution forces in society and, and, and help build an actual party, an actual force that can put forward a program that's going to solve all of these issues in the first place. Once someone has gone so far um, into the, the depths of, of the far right messaging and message mm -hmm. boards and so on and so forth, they're, they're gone, mm -hmm. they're gone. But they are still a minority and that's the other important thing. It is not the case that fascism as a whole is on the verge or is close to taking power in Britain. Mm -hmm. that, that's, and that's not going to happen. However, this small minority of fascists can still terrorise people and mm -hmm. terrorise people's lives. Um, and even the fact that they were able to do all of this stuff is, is, still, is still completely unacceptable. Um, so let's physically stop them whilst politically also building the alternative mm -hmm. to this. Um, and so I think this whole thing has been, has been a real wake-up call um, mm -hmm. for, for many of us. So yeah, I think that probably brings us to the end of this week's uh, discussion. Thanks very much for joining us, Thank Fiona. You. And yeah, thanks as well to our listeners and viewers at home for tuning in once again to Marxist Voice. I'm sure we'll have plenty more uh, future episodes covering current events as well as Marxist theory, uh, history, philosophy, economics, all of these different questions. In fact, we've actually got the, uh, the Marxist, the Communist Summer Camp uh, coming up this yes. week. We're going to have about uh, 10 different uh, talks, is that right? Yeah. All of those are going to be recorded and they're going to be up on this podcast in due course. Yeah. I'll be giving a talk on uh, how communists can fight for oppressed nations. How about yourself? I'm talking on um, South Africa and the fall of apartheid in South Africa. Fantastic. That sounds very interesting. I'm pretty sure we haven't actually discussed that on the, uh, on the podcast before, have we? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah, so there's a, there'll be a full list of uh, different topics that you can have a look at maybe in the description of uh, this podcast. Um, yeah, make sure you stay tuned, first of all, to Marxist Voice for future episodes. But even more than that, if you agree with the analysis that we're putting forward, the program that we're putting forward, then you need to get organized. You need to get organized with us, the Revolutionary Communist Party, um, so that we can, first of all, yes, put a stop to the threat of the, the far right, um, but more than that, to overthrow the rotten system and the rotten establishment, which is allowing this menace to grow and grow. So yeah, if you want to sign up to get involved, head to the link in the show notes of this podcast. You can fill out an application form and be put in touch immediately with your closest branch. Uh, and more than that, you can also subscribe to our newspaper, The Communist, which is packed full of Marxist analysis, as well as our theoretical magazine as well, In Defense of Marxism, which is fantastic. There's a brand new issue which deals with the question of Marxism and art and culture, which I really enjoyed reading. And lastly, if you want to support this podcast as well as the party as well, then you can donate to the RCP using the link down below. But I think that is everything for this week. Um, so thanks once again for joining us. And yeah, we'll see you uh, in the future for, for more episodes covering Marxist theory, revolutionary history, and current events. Brought to you by the Revolutionary Communist Party. <laughs>